Good evening and welcome. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division. We are very excited tonight to present the world premiere of a new work by Brett Dean, Rooms of Elsinore. And it's wonderful to have the composer here with us. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ann. And you've come from Berlin for this week here at the library, and our pianist, Juho Pohjonen, has come on a run out from Finland, I, I believe. Yes. It's great. And this is your first time at the library. You said, I think, that the uh, Santa Fe Festival had helped to introduce you, and you, this is new? That's, that's right. Um, I mean, I think we have Mark Nykrug much to thank uh, for us coming together and for this, this uh, commission coming about. And so Juho was a guest of the festival last year for the first time? Yes, um, just this past summer. And Mark and I were talking, and uh, for the last couple of years, working with Anne in the library, we've been planning this commission and this concert. So uh, the premieres tonight, and then we'll play it again in Santa Fe with both of you in July. Yeah, that's right. So I, let me uh, step back a moment. I didn't, didn't get to introducing my colleague, Steve Ovitsky, from the Santa Fe Festival. And uh, we are pleased that you have brought with you a number of friends of the festival tonight. We have about 25 board members and spouses, partners, <laughs> supporters, um, who are here from everywhere. I mean, many of them live in Santa Fe year-round. We have a couple here from Savannah, um, one from San Francisco who just came in for this. So um, our board and our supporters are all over the country because we exist in only a six-week festival during the summer, so they come in for the music, and uh, we're delighted that so many of them came along to hear this concert tonight. And I know that commissioning has always been an important thing for Santa Fe, just as it is, of course, for the library, but you presented and commissioned and presented the string quartet we'll hear tonight, string quartet number two, and once I played Ophelia. We're looking forward to this. And Tony Arnold is just an amazing singer. Absolutely astonishing, yeah. So when was this? A couple of years ago? It was 2014. 2014, yeah. yeah in 14. Um, the, the piece tonight, um, what Brett didn't mention is that not only did he compose it, but he's playing it tonight as well. And, um, but in 2014, we commissioned uh, the string quartet that you'll hear with soprano. And we also commissioned, we, we've done a number, over yeah. the last seven years, six or seven years, um, Brett came to us once as a violist, and we, then the next year we commissioned a piece, I think a string quintet. Well, I've always had my viola with me. Yeah, I know. Santa Fe, but, uh, and, and the previous commission was the string quintet. The quintet. Uh, so yeah. this is the third piece we've commissioned from Brett, and uh, that's pretty close to a record for the festival. We've commissioned about 75 pieces over the last 42 years, and we do about two or three a year. And um, you are probably the most commissioned composer right now. I feel very honored. Right. <laughs> You know, uh, for us, it, it's exciting to have you here because you join a very distinguished line of composer performers who have performed here, and uh, one was Paul Hindemith in 1937, uh, also playing his own viola music, um, and of course many others like Copland and Bernstein and so on. So as a conductor, composer, and violist, we're looking forward to sort of chatting for a moment about the whole picture of the state of the art of the viola today. You have the big perspective on, on everything. But before we get to that, I wanted to ask you about some of the manuscripts. I know that you and Yuho had a moment yesterday to look at some manuscripts, including the Märchen Builder, which you can see in the cases tonight. This is a fairly recent acquisition by the library. And I understand you made a discovery of something. Well, yeah, I mean, there was a, there's a spot in the third movement that has always struck me as slightly odd, um, where the, the piano has this beautifully rhapsodic moment in the, the, the trio section of an otherwise fairly tumultuous scherzo movement. Um, and the viola just has these sort of pizzicato notes that go up the, the A string. And I was keen to look at that very spot. And sure enough, there's, there's an extra note um, in, in the original that we're going to put back in tonight. Tonight? <laughs> yes, wow. it's a first. This is, a fir this is exciting, though I'm glad we're getting you on video. <laughs> Anything that you noticed, you Well, I noticed in the first moment that there was uh, one spot that actually had bothered me for a long time because mm. there's a transition to the 
B section, from the A section, which happens very abruptly. And I discovered in the manuscript that he had a longer transition wow. for like 16 bars worth of music, which okay. he removed. So that's why it feels very uh, sudden. Yeah, and then when you know what his original train of thought was, then somehow the, the, the suddenness of the transition it makes, makes sense. complete sense. Because yeah, yeah. you see, no, he went down that path and realized, no, that's not what I mean. Yeah. Mm. So you, have a, you never know what you'll discover here. I remember once uh, George Schulte came to look at some manuscripts and he went out with a big smile on his face and somebody ran after him in the hall and said, Maestro, what did you find out? And he, he said, oh, I found something no one has ever seen before. <laughs> he didn't say what it was. <laughs> it was either, but... In, in the manuscript, so is the... The, is that transition then crossed out in the manuscript? Completely crossed out. In fact, pro, uh, never fully worked through anyway, mm -hmm. but he just then crossed it out. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, also found a fascinating discovery in the Schoenberg Quartet, which I'm not playing in tonight, but have played on previous occasions. And the famous line in the last movement, which is also famously the, the first sort of free atonal piece that Schoenberg ever wrote and to the to the words ich fühl die Luft von anderen Planeten I feel the yes, air of other planets planet. yeah, he this. shortened that transition as well by a whole bar hmm. such that the impact of the chord in the in the quartet is followed much more immediately than in the in the in the final version where you've seen him scribble out a bar by the soprano coming in. And so he realized then also that it needed to, the shock of that moment needed to, you know, result more quickly. I didn't know that you had seen that one yesterday. And, well, you know, as long as we're talking about this, let's let's shift and go talking about the Schoenberg. Um, we were thinking of talking later, but um, Steve, you have talked about this too, how lush the piece is. And I know that it's a, it's a work that, as you say, had a very personal meaning for Schoenberg himself. And uh, what for me was so striking was this, this contextual juxtaposition of the Stefan George expressivist poetry that you're quoting, and then this strange quote of the Octu Libre Augustine you know, in there. But you were talking about the harmonic aspects of the I work. I was just saying that, that um, when I talk to some of our um, board people who, who are mostly non-musicians but, but deeply in love with chamber music, and sometimes when they see the name Schoenberg, they get a little, they still, after a hundred and some years, get a bit frightened. Um, um, a few years ago, we did a remarkable performance of uh, Verklärte Nacht with the Orions as the main um, the quartet in that, and it brought the house down. Everyone just really loved it. And I was telling our board people at dinner the other night how this quartet number two is is in that same cut. It's that same um, very ultra romantic style. It's just before the atonal style, and how how passionate a piece it is, especially since everything that was going on in his life that. Uh, that helped him, or that, that had, didn't help, but it but sort of moved him to write this quartet. Um, it was a very difficult time in his life when he wrote this. And, um, and that they should sort of relax, forget the name, forget what they think they know about Schoenberg, and listen to it as a late romantic piece, and then it makes sense to them. And, and if I may, it, it then makes sense of how the atonal thing evolved because you then see it in the context of these three previous movements that are getting more and more extreme, including, as you say, this, this sort of bizarre uh, you know, folk tune in the middle of it. Um, and then you see that, that the lift-off of the last movement into a completely you know, tonal-free world, although it's still quite tonal and it ends still in F-sharp minor as well, but, or F-sharp major then, but... Um, it, it makes sense. You see that he could only go that path. The one thing about this program tonight is that rarely do you hear a string quartet with soprano. Tonight there are two of them. And the two best ones that I know of. I don't know. What, are there any others? Can you there are several. Of yeah, yeah. I'm sorry? Uh, I think, but piano as well. The, the Dover Beach. I Dover don't Beach. I think it has piano and, and piano. And, and, piano. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
this is a beautiful program. I mean, it, it fits together so well and um, has such so many threads running through it. Before, uh, and I want to talk to you about your Shakespeare universe that you've been inhabiting for quite a while. Before we leave the Schoenberg, I wanted to say that um, our colleague found a very interesting photograph that's on display out here, which I didn't even know we had. Apparently, George Gershwin was a big fan of Schoenberg. I did not know that. And this is a photograph that he arranged to have commissioned. It's very, of course, austere, you know, in Schoenberg, what he looked like. Yeah, he never smiled, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. And um, on the, it, apparently Gershwin liked the quartets very much, and he subscribed to their publication. And then on this photograph, you'll see he has transcribed a few phrase, a tiny bits of music from both the first quartet and the fourth quartet. So it's just a bit of, you just never know what you're going to run across here, and it's fun to unearth these things. But... Um, we have so much to, to, to ask you about, about this new piece, Rooms of Elsinore, and also about um, the fact that you have been really, as I say, inhabiting this world. How did you become so in, involved with the world of Shakespeare's Hamlet? Well, about seven years ago, um, after the premiere of my first opera, which was based on an Australian novel by Peter Carey called Bliss, um, it was performed among other places, firstly in Australia, then also in, in Hamburg. And uh, the Hamburg production was seen by, the at the time, the managing director of Glyndebourne Opera in the UK, who then approached me to write uh, a, a second opera. Um, so, I mean, I must say one of the, the trickiest things is really s setting upon and, and, and being happy with the choice for a an opera story because it's something you're going to live with for quite a few years of one's life and so you want to make sure you've made the right decision. Um, and so after quite a bit of deliberation and a fair bit of, of daunting at the, the Shakespeare factor, um, I decided to uh, dive right in and, and write not only a, a Shakespeare opera but Hamlet. Um, and I'm thrilled also tonight that my librettist, Matthew Jocelyn, is here from Toronto um, because he's been very much, um, you know, my partner in crime through, through this journey. And um, it's been a, an extraordinary thing to, to delve into every single word, not only of Hamlet as we know it, but all the different versions. I mean, uh, Matthew brought into play the, the early first quarto, and the, the differences between the other the other versions as well, and so we've we've nutted out mm -hmm. a um, our own version of, of Hamlet over these past years, and the journey started with the string quartet that we'll hear tonight. Yeah, I, I had wondered about, and I saw that uh, you had you and Matthew had sat down to read the entire quarto in five hours or something yourselves to really hear every word. I was fascinated to see on the video that you talked about this about just examining the the fragments and the phrases and so forth and I know that this piece tell us about the the string quartet you wor use words from other people besides Ophelia well Matthew's um, idea then for, for this libretto um, in which we knew right from the start we had one soprano um, it was obvious that we were then going to examine <laughs> one or other of the, the female characters. In a sense, we examine both Ophelia and Gertrude, but specifically Ophelia, but not only her words, but also words that are said to her or about her, or, for example, Hamlet's love poem that, that he writes to her. In this way, we were able to focus on various aspects of this one person, but also then start exploring other characters as well mm -hmm. um, and see a kind of uh, micro version of the whole play through the prism of this one extraordinary character. Well, it's in June, right, at Glyndebourne? It premieres in, in just a couple of months, yeah. It's all very exciting. And we were uh, touched, really, to see you, to read about this, given that our piece with the name Rooms of Elsinore is about uh, Hamlet's potential or pur pur purported castle, and to realize that this brings you to a sort of a full circle of, of your passionate endeavor to explore this. Um, did you actually go to the Cronenberg Castle, I understand? Yeah, um, I, in the, the midst, fairly early on in, in the journey, my wife Heather, who's also here tonight, um, she and I 
then paid a visit to the Kronborg, mm -hmm. uh, north of Copenhagen, on the strait between Denmark and, and Sweden. And whilst I know that the director of the Glyndebourne production, the Australian director, Neil Armfield, isn't planning on it being a period <laughs> costume drama, it was still fascinating to walk through this space, also accompanied by the thought that we never, you never know, he may have been there himself as a, as a traveling player. There were lots of performances there at the time. Um, and just to get a feel for how the, the unfolding of the play in a physical space could have happened. And so, in a, in a way, this, this piece, uh, Rooms of Elsinore, is, is a kind of guided tour of where the action takes place, um, following through the, the dark gate of the, of the beginning into the, ch the king's chamber, the chapel, the queen's chamber. Um, and, and it was also a nice and, I think, fitting way of, of closing the book on, on a, an almost four-year journey through Hamlet. Amazing that it has been four years for you. Um, do you feel... Do you feel that you, well, let me say, take a step back on that. I notice you talk about literature as a huge influence and you've talked about the sense of place. Um, would you mind saying what the, the programmatic titles of the, something about the, the, the spaces and so on? Because I found them, listening to you rehearse the work, I found them very evocative and very different from each other. Even though I didn't know the program per se, I didn't right. think about them. But yeah, and they were, they were fascinating. And also, then could we talk a little about the role of the piano too? Um, the piano yeah, well, writing. That'll be for you to say a few yeah, words I about. Not, I'll, I'll, yeah. The sense um, of place, yeah. Well, I mean, having taken quite a few photos from the Kronborg wow. uh, when we visited and having them also placed on, on mm -hmm. my studio wall um, <laughs> alongside a, a long sort of storyboard uh, in shaping this opera, um, I also had the, the tourist map of, of the, the castle with, you know, the numbered sort mm -hmm. of um, highlights of where you go through. And so that's mm -hmm. somehow what, what brought about this idea of, of the this, this suite of seven movements, which open with the dark gate, mm -hmm. um, and it proceeds then without a break into the four-gate courtyard. Um, the dark gate and the courtyard and, and the following movement, the, the platform, all relate to material that I've used in the opera that, that is the moment where the ghost appears. Mm -hmm. First of all, in the, in the original play, uh, Horatio and Marcellus see the ghost and tell Hamlet about it later, and then, bam, he sees, sees the ghost himself, mm -hmm. which sets the whole uh, drama in motion. We then proceed to uh, the fourth movement, a, a, a long and, and very busy dramatic movement called The King's Chamber, where obviously so much of all that goes on and all the intrigue uh, in the play takes place. We then proceed to the chapel, um, the place where Hamlet uh, chances upon Claudius and actually sees an opportunity to kill him when Claudius is confessing to the murder of King Hamlet. Um, Hamlet sneaks up behind him but then realises that seeing the king is confessing his sin in church, to kill him there would mm. send him to heaven and he doesn't want that. He then proceeds from the chapel to the queen's chamber to confront his mother about all that's going on, having just witnessed the, the play and being convinced that what the, the ghost originally told him must be true. <laughs> so then the, the queen's chamber is, is an, the other sort of longish movement um, which conjures this, this drama of, of the ghost's reappearance where Hamlet sees the ghost but Gertrude doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, then to close this, this particular you know, scene setting piece of, of um, seven movements I've proceeded then to the trumpeter's tower which isn't a, a moment from the opera but gives us a kind of bird's eye view of the whole you know, it's surveying the, the area in which the whole play has taken place. This is great because on the video that will be uh, connected to tonight's performance, we will, we will put this together and that way people will have a chance to really hear what was in your mind as you worked through this. And um, I, I had wondered too if your wife's paintings had, were, have they been in this storyline at any point? I know you've been influenced well, by the, a lot of them. Very much right from the start. Um, 
while I was still umming and ahhing about whether I could possibly take on Hamlet, Heather picked up the ball and ran with it and started a, a cycle of paintings, um, which is also still ongoing, and, and she'll also be doing two exhibitions in the UK mm, at the wonderful. same time as the production. One in in Glyndebourne itself on the walls of the of the uh -huh. theatre, and oh, wow. uh, the other in London. So right. yeah, the very I mean, it's a it's a, a creative relationship between us that is you know, charged by uh -huh. what the other is up to, really. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, and so let's talk about your relationship here, too. I was fascinated to see you put this together this week, and uh, having found out that you didn't know each other before, what has that been like for you, totally new to each other and so on? Well, I've had a great time, but maybe <laughs> course, you, can, you can say. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the, I got the music about a month ago, which mm. is, I mean, it sounds pretty short time to put together something, but actually... It's a lot of time. And uh, we went through a few revisions of the score and we made some changes. Even today you made mm. some changes. Really? Oh, wow. um, of course, first thing is to just practice separately mm. the different parts. And uh, then we met together two days ago, yeah. three, two, three days ago, two three three days, days ago. ago. Yeah. Well, what's today? Saturday. We met, we started on Thursday. Thursday. Right. And I'm so glad you've you've almost had a mini residency this week in a way. Um, and thanks to David Pilaro, my colleague, who had shown you those treasures. It's a way of sort of introducing you to the larger picture of the library, and um, you know, you've got a mini tour and so on. But often artists come in, and we don't have the time to spend with them. So it, it's pretty exciting for us about this. Well, about about the um, the writing for uh, the um, the work, the Rooms of Elsinore. Um, I was going to ask you about, we can talk a little bit about the viola too, and then I want to get back to sort of new music as, another, as, a, as a final topic. But about the writing for this one, you've mentioned that you thought this viola, the Tuscan Medici, was especially perhaps a good match because of its um, finesse, uh, the variety of things, and its fast response. I remember you said those those words, fast response. And then I know it's <clears throat> there are a lot of textures and so on. And in your score, you say the word whisper at one point, I think. Some things like that. Did you find that this viola helped you to express some of those things that you had in your mind? Well, I mean, a great instrument is is a great instrument because it can give you so, so much, because it has such a, a wide palette of colours. Mm -hmm. And the, the tricky thing is is getting to know an instrument of of that quality in such a short time but um, and and originally I, I was actually thinking I'd play the Schumann on on the Stradivarius and and my piece on my own instrument but it was just so immediate the the relationship we struck up that um, I thought no I mean get, get a chance to play on a Strad of that quality no I'll uh, I wouldn't mind one, really, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's very special. Well, this one, um, as many people in the audience tonight will know, is on loan to the library. It's a special one uh, made in 1690. It's very powerful and uh, has a great deep register. It really sings. It speaks, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Before we leave your piece, um, you ho any comments on the piano writing? <laughs> but the piano right. I mean, I just play the music and hope for the best. Oh, so, um, oh my goodness! <laughs> but, uh, but what I appreciate about your writing is that the piano and viola they are pretty much equal in terms of the importance. So there's lots of things happening in the piano and also in the viola. And uh, of course, because of the different characteristics of the instruments, the viola has more melody because that's what string players can play only one line and piano has more texture and the texture is kind of something that creates color and atmosphere. So in a way I have plenty of things to do and, and mm -hmm. have effect on. He's in charge of the spooky bits really. <laughs> There are some spooky bits. There really are, um, and and you'll be. It'll be great to have a recording of this too. It's sort of sort of ethereal wisps here and there. Yeah, and I could see you know things floating in the air above the ramparts and things like that. Maybe. Um, 
I liked your piece that this uh, comment about this piece having a dramaturgy of its own. So it's it's pro programmatic, but you don't need the program to hear it and understand it. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by you know how music comes across, particularly new music, if you don't know anything about it. Um, you know, you, you sort of turn on the radio and come into the middle of a piece, and what does that say to you? And I I do always hope that. The, the, the piece of music, although most of my pieces have some sort of, not necessarily program, but extra musical aspect or component to them, I like to think that they will also make sense mm -hmm. on purely musical yeah. um, abstract terms, if you like. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that the piece has its own charge um, and, and fascination aside from, mm -hmm. from the, the titles of the movements. Which it certainly does, and you you will enjoy this this piece very much. Well, as uh, segueing into just new music, since that is such a strong aspect at Santa Fe and both here, um, wh what do you see any sort of not a uh, resurgence? But I feel there's a lot more new music being written for the viola these days. That's just really excellent. Um, what is your perspective on that? You used to be sort of a poor stepchild in a way. Well, because the, I mean, violists are. Uh, we're the slow ones, um, and so we've been slow on the uptake at developing our own repertoire, or at least composers have, have neglected the, the violas for such a long time that it's now coming into its own in many ways. I mean, in the, in the latter sort of 20th century and into the 21st century, um, it's really been recognized for its own, on its own terms. It's, it's not a violin, it's not a cello, it's very much its own thing and has a very distinctive color. And I mean, it's also through the commissioning process of first festivals such as yours, Steve, that, that has sort of brought about a lot of these opportunities. Also the, the double viola quintet of mine, just to speak of my own things, but also no doubt many other things as well. Um, and so, you know, it is, it is finding its, its repertoire. And we don't have the kind of, you know, the, the legacy of, of umpteen Mozart or Beethoven sonatas to fall back on. And so it's still, it's still happening now. I think so. And do you, have you had any new pieces that are, you'd like to mention that have come along for you? In well, this, this summer, um, the festival goes between the 16th of July and the 21st of August. And during that time, we have about 45 concerts uh, in just under wow. six weeks. Uh, some weeks, it's almost like your schedule uh, here, but some weeks we have uh, as many as seven concerts in a week. And um, about 80 to 100 musicians usually come to the festival. And this summer we have three new pieces, the one you'll be hearing tonight that we co-commissioned with Anne and the Library of Congress, um, a piece for piano solo by... Um, Julian Anderson, that was co-commissioned with the Alderbro Festival, and um, a piece by Bill Balcom, William Balcom, a sextet for mixed wind strings and piano that we uh, co-commissioned with the Chamber Music Northwest in Portland. And um, that's, that should be, I'm really looking forward to hearing that one as well because a few years ago we were talking with uh, Bill and with David Schifrin, the clarinetist who's uh, the artistic director of Chamber Music Northwest, and we we're talking about what kind of interesting, you know, interesting orchestration could we do? And we had just played Martinu's Revue de Cuisine, which is um, like violin, cello, trumpet, bassoon, piano, and I think clarinet. Right. But um, and Bill said that's a great combination, so he wanted to do that, <laughs> and then. Unfortunately, after we had planned the season, he said, <coughs> what would happen if I changed the orchestration to the same orchestration as Walton's facade? Oh my goodness. And we, we were already locked in and we couldn't do it. And, and the more I think about it, I love the orchestration of facade mm -hmm. and it, it would be a great piece. So maybe that'll be another time with, with Bill because he loves writing pieces that are a very, um, very agreeable to the audiences and also have such cleverness in the orchestration and the composition. So those are three new pieces this summer. And we have commissions for summer of 18 and summer of 19 we're working on now. So um, we're always doing about three new works every, every summer. Wonderful. Yeah, both co-commissions and single commissions. Mm -hmm. And um, Yuho, do you do a lot of new music, or is your mus your performing career mostly 
Uh, I do every kind of music, but I, wonderful. But yeah. I, I play very sh- in a short time uh, Esa Pekka Salonen's piano concerto, which is wow. Very I'm kind a, of different I'm a kind of writing fan. from yeah. yours, but Fantastic. very interesting music too. And what's the recording project you mentioned that you're going back to? Oh, that's old music, Bach. <laughs> <laughs> Six. A nice mixture. Sonata but timeless. Yes. Yeah. So um, one of the things that while you were talking, Steve, I was thinking about Kim Kashkashian's comment that she felt music, new music for the viola was more supported in Europe. Uh, and I said, why would you, why do you say that? And she said she thought there was still government subsidy enough for orchestras there that you found the odd concerto coming through because of that. And you, of course, have an orchestra background. And I hadn't thought of that being a strong element in why there might be more viola pieces for uh, orchestra now. And you you conduct your own work a, a great deal. Um, you have war, more than one concerto? Uh, well, I've written myself a viola concerto. Um, I've got other concertos. But, um, yeah, the viola concerto format uh, mm-hmm. or genre is something that I think has led the charge of new yeah. repertoire for the viola. Um, and, I mean, it's a tricky, it's a tricky beast. Um, the viola... In, in saying that it's it's certainly not the violin or the cello, it also sits um, very much in the middle of, of an orchestral range, mm-hmm. and so scoring for it is is something you know in a in a concerto setting is something you've got to be a bit careful about. I know I've had to rewrite my own concerto a few times because I couldn't <laughs> be heard. So um, you know you, you live and learn, really. So, do we? I, I would love to talk more, and in fact, we will have to have offline conversations about: Have you seen the Benedict Cumberbatch Hamlet, and have you seen the David Tennant Hamlet, and a few other things like that? But we want to give the audience a chance. So, does anyone have a question for our, our colleagues here? Yeah. One second, one second. Uh, it's on. Okay. Um, actually. And this is this is an additional. I walked in when you made the comments on Gershwin and Schoenberg, and I wanted to add something to that because I understand not only did Gershwin subscribe to the publication of the Schoenberg quartets, he helped finance recordings of them in the 1930s by the Kolisch Quartet, which I think can still be found on CD in the secondary market. Um, and they uh, they played tennis together in Los Angeles regularly. There's a clip of them playing tennis. You yes, said? yes, they, wow. they 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 enjoy playing tennis with each other. There's a clip that can be seen on YouTube of them doing this. Oh, um, goodness. And not only did Gershwin greatly respect Schoenberg, but the, it went the other way too. Schoenberg had great respect for Gershwin as a composer. Um, when Gershwin died in 1937, there was a memorial book put out of reminiscences, and Schoenberg's is one of the most touching in the whole collection. And I believe there's even a recording of him reading a section of it also on YouTube. So oh. we draw this hard line sometimes between tonal and serial 12-tone yeah, I mean, music. Exactly. It, 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 sometimes they're a lot closer than we... And, and composers don't see it as a right. hard line, yeah. and, uh, which brings me back to my comment about the, the, the second quartet. It, it's not a hard line. It's, it's actually, it floats from one into the other, and I think that's what's so remarkable about that, about that piece too. That's it, thanks. Yeah, interesting. Anyone else? I think... So um, I think we're in good shape. Brett is going to give our viola a little bit of a warm-up here. And thank you very, very much, Brett, Yuho, Steve. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.